So having covered the training principles and methods, um, and yesterday you guys would have looked at um, some exam style questions that you can reflect on in groups. We're moving on to the physiological factors that affect um, performance. So we've got a diagram here um, looking at anthropology, body dimensions, our somatotypes, genetics, body tissue composition, age, sex, and race and nationality. So those are the key factors that affect um, body structure and composition, and then we relate that to performance. So first one, looking at body fat. So the questions that we're going to ask ourselves here, are all, all fats are the same, and how does fat affect our performance? So we have to um, appreciate that excess storage fat will affect our performance because um, excess storage fat can lead to decreased mobility. Um, it can also lead to a decrease in acceleration due to dead weight um, and a decrease in speed maintenance. Because when we're looking at our weight um, ratios, uh, obviously if we've got a high percentage of muscle, that's all contributing to that power and acceleration where the fat is just dead weight. It's not actually helping us in any manner. It's not um, contracting, not relaxing, not um, um, helping any movement. It's just sitting there. So, in fact, it's a very body structure and composition. Looking at ma muscle mass. So what is muscle mass? How is it measured? And how does it influence performance? So muscle has weight, it's heavier than fat, and that often affects our BMI ratings. Um, it affects acceleration and therefore the speed of an athlete because what happens is um, it allows us to perform um, greater contractions and it needs to take care um, not to build too much fat for this reason. Now, um, if you look at sprinters, uh, very, very bulk, uh, bulky and muscular, um, looking for that that. Um, speed over 100 meters where the composition of a 400 meter might be a bit leaner um, through the speed maintenance because it's harder to, to hold that speed over a longer period of time with the more weight that you carry. So muscle is weight and it's good for acceleration however in terms of speed maintenance um, the longer distance you've got to go the leaner you want to be. So um, there's two types of muscle fiber, the fast twitch and the slow, and the slow twitch. So the, the white and the red. Um, and then we can, here we can see uh, the different characteristics, most of which we should know. So the fast twitch fibers, we know that the contraction time is very fast. Um, the resistance to fatigue is low. They become very fatigued very quickly. Um, and it's all related to our creatine phosphate systems, where our slow twitch fibers looks at that um, sustaining of, of movement and exercise for longer periods of time. So here, do we have the same fiber ratio? So our muscle fiber ratio can determine the activity that we might see in elite athletes. Now, um, with normal people, so average people like you and me, um, that might not be in elite sporting um, uh, organizations, we're gonna see generally a 50-50, um, maybe 60-40 either way, um, depending on what we're better at. So for example, I, I'd have a quite a percentage of slow twitch fibers, maybe 60-40 fast twitch fibers, which sees me not be able to have much acceleration. Um, my speed is generally lower than the average person's. Where somebody else that might have a real high percentage of fast twitch fibers, um, might be a really good 100, 200 meter sprints, um, but then they may really struggle at, um, say, two or three kilometer runs, maybe up to five, 10 kilometer runs. So we can see there the sprinters looking at, so we can see here for the slow twitch, 24% for sprinters, 76. So it's not a full complement. It's not just sprinters would have 100% of fast twitch fibers um, and zero slow twitch fibers that you know sprinters might they have to be able to recover and things like that so um you know walking um day to day activities so we can just see that high percentage long distance runners 69 percent and 31 percent again just as a um for you to be able to appreciate that um like energy systems we're working together somatotyping all right so you would have heard th about this before again 
but are three somatotypes are mesomorph, ectomorph, and endomorph. They affect performance. So your somatotype, elite athlete somatotypes, just like um, muscle fiber types, will affect performance. So how um, so, so how is it going to affect the performance? So it's a method of grouping body shape. So three categories. So we're looking at endomorphs, for example. So they have little muscle definition, high proportion of fat. Um, large muscle max impacts ability in sports where speed, agility, activities are required to sustain a long time. So things like running, they're not going to be good at. Tend to have short arms and legs, prominent stomach and hips. So they're suited to activity where one maximum strength effort might be required, such as power lifting, wrestling, um, shot put, a general power sports. So what they will do is put on muscle bulk um, easily and readily, and they also put on weight easily and lose condition quickly. So they um, they will have a low uh, ability to be able to or have a um, they would yeah they lose that conditioning quite easily. Then we have a mesomorph. So really athletic shaped people. So they have wide shoulders, generally looking like that triangle figure. Um, wide shoulders, um, muscle, arm and legs, narrow hips, minimal fat. Um, they're described as web shape, uh, wedge shaped. So they excel in strength, agility, speed type activities, large amounts of muscle. Tendency to put on muscle make them ideal for any real sport. So particularly team sports where relative... Um, Power and speed um, are, and mass are optimal. So where you have to do a multitude of different movements, skills, activities, mesomorph are going to be the optimum type of, of body weight for that, uh, body type for that. So, I mean, with the endomorph and the ectomorph, they're obviously going to fit specific types of sports. Mesomorph will generally cover most types of sports. Ectomorphs. So they have little muscle definition, low muscle mass and body fat. They have long, slender and thin with narrow shoulders and hips, thin arms and legs. So they're not at all suited to power and strength sports where muscle bulk is essential and they tend to dominate the endurance events and events where lighter muscle mass are advantageous. So things like long distance running, race walking, um, things like that where they can go for long periods of time. Um, like triathlons, um, Ironman triathlons, things like that. They're best for ectomorphs. So now we've got to think um, and just give yourself five seconds. Um, two suitable type of sports for each body type. So ectomorphs, you might have marathon and triathlon. Endomorph. Might have weight, lifting, and shot put. Mesomorph, you might have AFL, and you might have netball. Alright, so, you know, as long as you guys know sports, they're going to fit each um, body type, somatotype, and you understand how it's going to affect performance, and um, you can know the sports from relation. You should be right with answering any questions related to that. Okay, let's have a look at a case study. So um, two different contrasting sports. So Ronda um, is 187 centimetres, 79 kilos, age 21. So her sport is volleyball. I'd say she'd probably be a mesomorph. Um, Sarah Brown, height 149 centimetres. 34 kilos, age 15, and gymnastics. So she's probably looking at that mesomorph towards ectomorph. Totally different sports to see both the profiles. They have completely different physiological dimensions. These dimensions make them well suited to those chosen sports. So describe the essential differences in physiological uh, physiology between the two athletes. So obviously there's a huge discrepancy in weight and height and age. So a 15-year-old... Um, yet to fully develop, would ten, tend to be a lot more flexible. They've been a lot more flexible in their joints. Plus, in terms of weight and height, they'd be able to manoeuvre their body into a lot more positions. Um, you know, relative power to their size as a gymnast, but that volleyball, volleyball athlete would have, you know, a lot of power base behind them. So let's have a look what they say. So height's a key, different as well as weight, without 
having the um, discussion that I just put there. So explain the, the advantage that a volleyball to the volleyball player of being tall. So what's something that they could you know they'd be able to um, block over the net. They'd be able to get up and be able to spike the ball from a relative position. So jump to hit the spike over the net, two metres plus size, requirement of the sport. So explain the advantage to the gymnast of being shorter than the volleyball player and related to the sport of gymnastics. So I talked before about um, being able to um, manoeuvre their body, be fairly flexible in a variety of positions. Let's see what they have to say. So greater stability as well. Centre of gravity is close to the ground. So something, again, we'll learn in our biomechanics unit. Genetics and performance. So... How do genetics influence performance? So if 10, minute, 10 million genetic variations in humans, all right, two, uh, 2005 that influence physical performance, 200 gene variations. So all things that can influence things like cardiovascular, uh, cardiorespiratory, endurance, strength, muscle size, muscle fiber composition, lung capacity, oxygen intake. So all these are affected by genetic variation. So, let's look at um, let's look at females and, and males differences. So, you can see here, male females have smaller bodies, females have shorter legs, females have narrow rib cage, females have wider hips, females have different pelvis, they have greater curvature in their spine than males, elbows and knees are bigger than males, they have smaller body frames, males have larger tendons and bigger. Um, anchor bigger muscles, so the force generation is bigger. Muscles have gr men have greater muscle volume. The men's neuromuscular systems have bigger muscle fibers. They have more motor units. Females have more adipose tissue, so more fat than males. Um, males have larger hearts than females. Males have greater blood blood volume, and females' lungs are smaller. So we can see lots of those relate to men being more powerful. Men have greater um, VO2 max, so they have a greater um, cardiovascular endurance or ability to utilize oxygen as that, as that energy. Females might have greater flexibility. All right. So um, how does culture or country origin affect the different sporting performance? So let's look here. So West definitely have advantage of track sprinting. So we have greater fast twitch fibers. The East... Um, definitely have greater endurance events. So those African um, nations where they're at, um, they tend to be at a, a higher, um, they, they have they slight body builds, they tend to have a low um, percentage of body fat, they tend to have um, higher aerobic capacity because they tend to live at altitude more. The um, Asian um, ethnicity tend to have shorter legs, um, they're smaller in height, better center of gravity, they're better at gymnastics, diving, weightlifting, table tennis, things like that. Also, culturally, you know, Australia's going to be better at Australian rules football. Um, China, they're going to be better at things like table tennis because it's more accessible. When you've got billions of people to be able to participate in table tennis, culturally, it's been brought up in those people. Same with martial arts. Um, you know, in Africa, where there's not many swimming pools, they're not going to be great swimming nations where they might be um, much better at the track performance. All right, so in terms of questions that go with this clip, so Essentials Guide, page 133 to 148, all questions and reading, obviously the same note-taking um, and highlighting and things like that. Good luck.